Luftwaffe. The roof in New Orleans were put on with slate. It was a skilled job. Uh, anybody can't put on a slate. So he was a skilled roofer, and he was a union man. And uh, he said, if you go to work and there's a union, join it, no matter what kind it is. Any union is better than none. And if there isn't one, then organize one. And I, I carried that out. I, I've helped organize unions. There once was a union maid. She never was afraid of goons and ginks and company finks and the deputy sheriff who made the raid. She went to the union hall when a meeting it was called. And when the Legion boys come around, she always stood her ground. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. Till the day I die. This union maid was wise to the tricks of company spies. She couldn't be fooled by company too. She'd always organize the guys. She'd always get her way when she struck for better pay. She'd show her car to the National Guard, and this is what she'd say. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union till the day I die. As a child, I was brought up on a farm with my older sister, younger sister and brother, and it was a uh, farm in Michigan. My folks were rather poor. We were growing healthy kids, and my father used to say, well, if you, you don't work, you just don't eat. And uh, so we said, well, we don't hear that from our friends, and I, where do you get that idea? He says, well, that's an old socialist tradition. My father's mother was a very unusual young woman, apparently. The usual rule was when a young man got married and he brought his bride home, she had to get up early the next morning and make breakfast for the entire household to show that she was worthy of being a part of that family. So she deliberately stayed in bed. So she waited until she figured everybody else was up and was down in the kitchen waiting for breakfast. And she looked at them and she says, I want to make it clear right here and now that I am not going to be a servant here. I am not going to come here and try to show you my worth as just what a good cook I am, what a good housekeeper I am, all of those things. I am not going to do that, but I'll tell you what I will do. I'll go out and work with the men. I'll do the plowing, and I challenge any male member of this household to outdo me when it comes to work. And I've often said, gee, I hope I've inherited some of my grandmother's fighting spirit. Was your father involved in the black movement? Yes, he, he was a Garveyite. Marcus Garvey was a, a black man, and he started a movement called the Universal Negro Improvement Association. It was all black. They didn't let any whites into the movement. And I remember my father and mother, my brothers and my grandmother, every Sunday night in the Longshoreman's Hall in New Orleans, there was a big mass rally, and all of the black came to this rally and they would come with music. There would be a band playing and it was it was such a prideful thing to walk in here, you know, to this music and you're going in to listen to the and I no remember there was one young woman who used to speak every Sunday my father would say, Don't you go to sleep. I want you to listen to what she's saying. Uh, because you I want you to be like her. When you grow up you have to be a speaker and, and, and go to rallies and, uh, and I had to sit there and listen to what she was saying. Did you hear what she said when she got home? And I would listen and I would know what she said. And we used to march in the parades and we used to have our big buttons on, you know, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And it was a great movement and it taught, if nothing else, uh, black pride. <laughs> In 
the late 20s, we all left home, looking for a new life in the big city, Chicago. Come on, baby, do you want to go? when we hit Chicago. Jobs were hard to come by, and the employers took advantage of it. Working conditions were just awful. Long hours, 12 to 14 a day, exhausting speed, low pay, but you needed to eat, so people took whatever little work they could get. seemed to be collapsing. But President Hoover told us that prosperity was just around the corner. Sweet home, Chicago. When you first got to Chicago, what did you think of it? I was just, you know, it's, it's like another world, you know. It's, I can imagine what people feel like when they go to the moon. That's the way I felt, you know. <laughs> Here I was brought up in a small, you know, village and had been to Kalamazoo, but never anything this large. It was rather overwhelming, you know. Really, very much uh, impressed in one way, but uh, scratch the sidewalk to see if the grass would grow. You know, that kind of story you read about. <laughs> Did you go to work right away? I tried to get a job. Herb was working in the stockyards and suggested I go there because I'd had experience and it paid more money, you know, than most places at that time. I guess it was 37 and a half cents an hour for women, 52 cents for men. It was a 15 cent hour differential. I decided that I had to go to work. I came here to go to work. Um, and I went, the nearest thing to where I lived was a laundry called Great Western Laundry. And all black women and poor whites worked in this laundry. And I decided to go there to find a job. So I went one morning and the man hired everybody and then he called me up and he said, have you ever had a job before in a laundry? I said, no. He said, well, we only hire an experienced help so you don't have to wait. There was a bloom factory right close to where we lived. And they, we lived on, in the slums of the west side. And um, my sister said, Katie, when you go to look for a job, I was 15, I think. Don't say you're, tell them you're 16. So I uh, came to the balloon factory, the man says, how old are you? I said, 16, he said, you're too young. So I'm back home. And he said, didn't I tell you yesterday we're not hiring any inexperienced? And I said, okay, so I turned around and walked out the next morning and I came back again. Next day, I went to a macaroni factory, and they said, how old are you? I said, I'm 17. You're too young. And he looked at me, and I guess he said, well, maybe I'd better hire her for some. Anyway, that morning, he, and he called me on me, he said, listen, I'm going to hire you, but if you don't do that work, I'll have no compunction all about firing me. I'll fire you just like that. And uh, said, anybody experienced? So I raised my hand. <laughs> she said, where did you work? I said, I butchered on the farm. But you didn't work in any stock here. No, I didn't, but I said I could do it. She said, okay. Uh, she looked me up and down. I said, uh, you know, I was 17. <laughs> you know, ruddy cheeks and so forth. And she says, uh, well, I'll start tomorrow morning. And that's what happened. I went to work in the cookroom. I remember when Herb took me down, and I heard the cows going through the ramp. And so I said, oh, Herb, they can't be killing those pretty cows. You know, I was a farm gal, milking cows. They are beautiful. And, I, you know, it just, just made me cry. They put me to work in the department that made um, 
men's dispensaries and athletic supports, and I hadn't the least idea of what the stuff was. And you made them all day long, you didn't know what they were? No, I had no idea what it was. <laughs> How'd you find out? Huh? How'd you find out? Well, by talking with the women. And then, oh, I was so shocked to think that's what I was working on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just working myself to death, just going so fast. And there were four women working on it. Two would shake out the sheets. I would take out the small pieces and shake them sheets. And, I mean, the towels and pillow slips. And the other woman would make out the tickets, you know, and, and bag up the things that did not have to go through the mangle. Did the, did the whites and blacks do different kinds of work? The whites and blacks did different kinds of work and made different kinds of pay also. How did you feel about the work at first? Well, horrible. I'll tell you why. Because it was very monotonous. You stopped to stop, you know, stood up in one place and just stayed there. And then you were told you can't talk and you didn't talk. And, you know, I'm quite gregarious and a uh, friendly sort of person. And I try to talk to my face. You want to keep your job, you don't talk. You just do your work. What used to burn me up and what really used to hurt was that there were men, if they ruined something, not only that it was deducted from your pay, but the foreman in the loudest voice possible would cut you out and call you the filthiest name. And I had seen grown men standing there and just sobbing, taking this insult because they had to have a job to feed their family. They took so much abuse that it was really, really hard. At that time, people lost fingers uh, and uh, limbs and got no compensation because there wasn't workman's compensation, there wasn't an unemployment compensation. So we talked about all these kind of things, and of course that was rather revolutionary in those days. This one woman was in the floor below. This is where they made the hot dogs. She would have to push the meat in and whatever, stuff, and she pushed her, pushed something, and the machine was going, the chopper in, and just cut the fingertips, you know. This friend of ours, she said something to that, well, how could they do this? They should have safety guards and all these, you know, because we talked about safety also. Well, and the people act to this incident, they were horrified, but they figured they couldn't do anything. Well, that night, a bunch of us got together, and we wrote out a leaflet on this and came out with certain demands and asked the women not to operate those machines until the company assured us that they would be safe guys. The whole plant heard about it. Did you hear these bunch of women actually organized and stuck together, you know, and they went right up to the foreman and, and you know, swore and said, you know, in Polish and in whatever, in English, you know, we know work. You fix a machine. Put safety guards on, you know, or something. So uh, they decided they were going to uh, hire a boss. And they hired a white woman, and she was going to, and I said, now, I don't know how we can work here. You know, we've been here two years, three years, and if they have to have a four lady, then it certainly seems to me that one of us should be the four lady. He's going to bring somebody in off the street who doesn't know the work here, we've been here doing it, so I think that, uh, that we should just not, they, we all got together, and what should we do? I said, let's just stop working, and then when I comes up, we'll tell him that we don't want her to be poor lady, we're not going to work under her. So we shut down the mangles, and this time when I came up the stairs, we didn't put him back on. So he walked up, and he was so surprised, and he looked like, what's going on here? What's going on? said, we're not working, we want to talk to you. Don't talk to me, start the mangles up. Uh-uh, not this time. So he came over and we got in a, uh, around him and we told him that we were not going to work with her as a poor lady. Now, he, he could put her on the table and let her do some shake out with him. And the police came. And had it been like today, I suppose, somebody would have been killed because we fought the police. I mean, we threw glasses at them and we threw bottles and they were trying to throw us out bodily and we were kicking and scraping. They finally got us out of the plant. And then I, I, we didn't know what else to do. It was already 1930, and when really things began to get very, very bad. So uh, they called a meeting at which the new superintendent announced that due to the economic situation, there would be a layoff of possibly 50% 
of the employee. And no mercy is to be shown to anyone. Does anybody have anything to say? And I say to myself, my gosh, Katie, you've got some responsibility. After all, you're a radical. You can't let this thing go by and just keep your mouth shut and be a coward. So I lift my hand. I said, I, I protest. And everybody was just shocked. And he says, what do you have to say? I said, well, sir, I'm opposed to it. I said, now, what are some of these old women going to do who are inspectors and they've worked here for years and years? I said, where are they going to find another job? I said, even a young person can't find a job. And what do you think the young women are going to do? Do you think that, do you want them to go down to 22nd and Wabash because that used to be the red light district of the time? So, I wrote an article to the Daily Worker telling about what they were going to do, and I asked them to send me, I think, about half a dozen or seven or eight copies, whatever it was, and I got them, and I set the thing out. So I cut out the articles, and I bought some thumbtacks, and as I went from one place to another, I would stick this uh, article that I had written, and I also put one up in my own department. By the time I got back from other departments, when I came to my own department, it was better. Somebody had shut off the machinery. Uh, the electric switch was at the end, you know. And one of the women was standing up on a table. Nobody was working. And one woman was up there reading the audience. Listen to this! Look! Look what it is! was printed in the newspaper, and it's about us. Somebody cares. Isn't that wonderful? Just look at this. Read it, you know. And she read the article. Hooray! Somebody's interested in us. Somebody cares what happens to us. And then the poor lady came running. She said, everybody get oh, back to your place. She had that everybody heard kind of an accent. She said, Catherine, uh, we have a feeling that you're very unhappy here. And we think it's best that we sever all connections. Here's your pay. So you're fired. So I was fired. Did the other women try to get your job back? No. When I called the girls, they said, look, what's the use of us speaking up? We'll only end up like you. We'll end up without a job. At that time, there was no union to, to, to join or anything. So, uh, so I said, no, that's quite all right. I said, don't worry about me. I'll, I'll be all right. Do you think if you've been more experienced, you know some of the things that maybe you learned later, that maybe something more might have come of that? Well, if some, not only was something more come, we would have organized that place. That was the beginning, would have been the beginning of the Laundry Workers Union. Because I'm sure that's the first sit-down strike that was ever held in this United States, and nobody ever knew anything about it. You think the people were ready for you? i sure they were. They were ready if they said, we're not going to work under this poor lady. They had to be ready. A few years later, I received a telephone call from the young woman who was my closest friend. And she said, Katie, guess what? She says, we've made it up to you, kiddo. We've finally made it up. She says, we've joined the union, and we're out on strike, and I'm the ticket captain. Now, how do you like that? we got to go down.
getting out a paper called a yards worker. And in this, we would talk about conditions in different departments. And wherever people worked, we made contacts with people who worked in other plants. We tried to find out where people worked in Robertson Oak, and Swift's, or Wilson's, etc. And we talk about these conditions. And then we'd try to sneak these papers into, into, uh, into, into the washrooms and wherever anyone we could not get. To, to sneak around. Oh, not only from our bosom, because there was inspection going in and out, you see. You were actually inspected. And you had to sign a yellow dog contract, which says, as long as I pledge that I am not a union member, and as long as I am an employee of this company, I will not join a union. They hired uh, stool pigeons who came in to try to disrupt and break up the union. You know, one thing after another, and not only that one, our first big meeting that we had, the Seattle rally, they had thugs come in with guns and try to threaten and scare us. You know, and they did. They scared off some women. You know, women did come around. And, mm -hmm. But uh, I was so, did by, you know, I was scared, but I went anyway, you know. I was getting together with these other people, young folk. By the way, they're all young. And uh, saying, well, here the CIO is taking the, the organizing and the sit down and plant. The steel workers are organizing, the automobile workers are. We want to organize too. We got out a whole bunch of leaflets and circulated them all over the stockyards and said we were having this meeting, this first meeting in school hall. Tremendous turnout. We didn't have room to put the people in. How many people came? Hundreds and hundreds, I don't know. Maybe 500, 400, I don't, I don't know how big the hall was. But it was the most inspiring thing, this great. We had cards, we had the um, Packing House Workers Organizing Committee cards. You know, I pledged to become a member of the union, so when we signed up people. At this time, did you, did you see yourself as a radical or as a... Oh, sure, sure, because I wasn't about to do housework or anything else. Because now I was convinced I became a dedicated radical. You know, working with these friends whom I liked and respected very much, it made a lot of sense, you know. Do you think very many of the people who were involved then in, in organizing the early CIO were also socialists? Most of them were, I think. Most were dedicated or had or sympathies in that direction. What would a socialist society mean to working people? Well, basically, uh, a socialist society would mean that uh, their means that the means of production would be owned by them and that the fruits of their labor would be divided on a more equitable basis than it was. There, there wouldn't be this tremendous disparity, that there wouldn't be uh, hunger, that there wouldn't be hovels for some people and palaces for others, uh, that there wouldn't be uh, uh, different scales of education mm -hmm. for children, mm -hmm. that there wouldn't be uh, war, hopefully, you know, I sat in on the meeting. They were just having an organizing drive. And everybody was getting up saying, well, I didn't get anybody signed up today because, you know, they would say, well, the union isn't any good. And when you get a union, you're going to have to pay union dues out of your money. If you don't have a union, you don't have to pay any union dues. And they talked, and I kept getting so disgusted. Here are these people trying to sell the union, and they aren't saying anything but what the, the, the workers are telling them. They're not telling the workers anything. So I held up my hand, and this guy recognized me. I took the floor, and I said, you know, at the rate you're going and what I'm hearing here tonight, you just ain't never going to get a union in this job. If these people here are the ones that are trying to get the people to sign the cards and join, they just are not, because they're not selling union, they are letting the workers sell their no union. Why don't you, nobody has said, now what is the union going to do for the workers when it gets in there? What are you going to do? They said, well, we're going to fight for more wages, better working conditions. We're going to fight. And they had grievances about something in the washroom. We're going to fight to straighten all that out. I said, did you tell him that? He said, of course. I said, why don't they tell the workers that? And I was really elected stood that night. 
And I think I signed up about five members. That very first night, look, I mean, you're not working on this ascending line if you don't join the union, sister. Please, let's get together. We shall not, we shall not be moved. The CIO had grown from a small number of organizing committees to a powerful force of several million. Contracts were won in steel and auto and maritime, but it didn't come easy. The whole idea of a militant labor force scared big business. They fought back in every way. We shall not move just like a tree that's standing by the wall. majority of the workers signed up? Long, long time. <laughs> in fact, you know, our people were fired for trying to organize. People lost their jobs. Some never got their jobs back. Um, the first plant that went CIO was actually where there was election was Armors. And uh, we called all, all kinds of meetings, departmental meetings, uh, union meetings, inside and outside on different issues. We got out the, the Armors got out an armor flashes mimeograph bulletin. After work, we'd go in there in the union hall and we'd learn to run the mimeograph machines, and <laughs> type, you know, everything. The women did the shit work then as they did now, you know, the old stuff. There was a lot of absenteeism among the women, you know, and they had this business where they would take your, your regular card out of the rack when you came back to work, and they would put in another card. Then you had to take this card out and write your excuse on it, and then take it to the foreman and give it to him, then he would, you know, this was, but we said these women are working seven days, we work seven days a week, you know, it was during the war, and they, they don't, their work doesn't end when they leave here. They had to go home and wash, and I, well, you know what a woman does when she gets off from the job, and working seven days a week, they don't have a minute, and we defy you to make those women sign those cards when they come in here. So we told all the women, you just put on the cards, just tie them. Just tie them. That's all the excuse you need. When you're working seven days a week and then working 24 hours a day, really, because you went home and you did, then you're just tired. And so everybody started put down on the cards, just tired. And they took those cards away. Those poor women would work all day, and then they'd come home and then have to take care of the house. Now the union was a man's job. I mean, this is the way it was looked upon. And the few of us who were active in the union were not married, didn't have families, you know. There were very few women who were actually married and had children who were active in the union. Very few. You only had so many hours in the day? Well, there was the beginning of the fight for child care. That the man would not, uh, he might not see this as a special need, you know. Because he might still be thinking that uh, the woman, she can take care of those children when she comes home, you know. It was a real sexist attitude then uh, by society sense. in general and, and by the radicals themselves. Uh, well, I think that it was sort of preordained and quote, you know, that the men would have all the leading jaw and leading roles. This is what happened. And the few women who uh, aspired to be leaders, if you want to put it that way, uh, didn't come by it easy. Uh, I had to take a lot of, a lot of gas. For a short time, I had a district position in Chicago. But I wasn't allowed in the inner circle, you see. 
because uh, I was too much of a proletarian or outspoken, whatever it was. And so I had a corner of a desk. Well, the, the top officials would go out and have lunch together. And they never invited me. I have a district membership secretary, come to think of it. And so when it was time for me to go to lunch, I would go to lunch with the stenographers. And one day, the, organ the district organizer called me in and he said, Catherine, it's very unbecoming for a person who is a district functionary, a district functionary, to go and have lunch with stenographers. I said to myself, go to hell. <laughs> I'll eat yeah. the snagger. What, what is this, a workers' movement, or what is it? And we have to work side by side with the men. I'm not saying that they have no place. They do, you know, and we have to, but we have to struggle sometimes against them because they don't recognize our worth, and sometimes there is jealousy. You know, this woman, you can't do this, you can't, and it's proven that, that uh, we can do anything at all. The most exciting meetings were those that were called at the shop gate, you know. And on any particular issue, union guys would show up with loud speaking systems. You walk out of your department with all, you know, your, your white, uh, dirty white, bloody white, or whatever, you know, you were wearing uniforms. And the workers would come out with it, and, and there would just a surge of faces and workers, you know, black, white, men, women. That's when the women really got to know about the union also, you know. And the speakers who would speak, and it would be a half hour lunch time. It never was just a half hour lunch time. When we got powerful enough, we took an hour or more. And the company didn't say anything. They couldn't. What, in what ways did workers couldn't. show their strength? That's one way, right there. On an issue like that, or if something came up during contract time, etc., they did that. Or if something happened in a department, uh, they just pull the chain and stop it. And stop it just right and left, all over the place. And if the men on the kill floor pull it, the chain, the whole damn place would close up. Were they the first ones to stop? There were many times. They were the most militant, the most radical. They knew they had power. You know, they really did. Because once they stopped the killing of the animal, you know, that's the first step. The whole the bang would close up. And it did. Didn't you say those people were mostly black people? Black mostly people? black, right. So the hardest jobs. I didn't give a kitty what happened to the white workers. All I was interested in was organized black workers. Now, you could have taken all the white workers out and shot them. They've been all right with me as long as you didn't bother black workers. Somebody comes dashing back in my department one night and says to me, uh, you know, they're going to fire that, uh, that woman up there. Um, and she was on the shop committee. I said, for what? And she said, she's out there fighting to get a black man in the tool room. I said, oh, come on, she's not fighting. You know, I didn't believe that. Why, why should she bother about whether a black man gets in the tool room or not? So the workers in the shop were angry with her in the tool and down because they said that they would not work in that department if they brought a black guy in there. So then all of the union officials get together, and we decide that uh, that's all right. If they don't want to work, then let them go. They can just, you know, get out. We didn't say it like that. We said it a little stronger. And uh, you say it? we said they can get the hell out. I mean, we'll <laughs> hire this black guy. We can go down on the next corner and hire as many workers as we need in here. So we went back, and we told them, if you don't want to work with the guy, then leave. Well, they finally hired the guy, and nobody left. They did not quit, and about three months later, the guy was still in the tool shop. Did mm -hmm. white workers at the beginning find it difficult to accept black workers as equals? There was always a tremendous discrimination where they lived, right, but not within the union, because they worked together, you know, and they worked alongside. There were black workers who knew Polish, for instance. There was one guy, Hackney, who became a union organizer, and I'll never forget, he went to a, a meeting, uh, spoke before a department of women, and start speaking Polish. Well, <laughs> they're so impressive. And, you know, all these women joined the union. It sounds like your attitude so, toward white people changed. Uh, Somewhat it changed. I right. learned that uh, you can't go any place unless you go together. And that it was important. This one woman who was out here fighting for this black man to get in this tool room, 
I'd never heard and never believed that such a thing could happen. And I found out that people working together and fighting together for the same thing is the only way you're going to get anything. But there were other things to be fought for besides organizing of labor unions. Millions of working people couldn't find jobs at all and they needed to organize to protect themselves, too. So I helped to organize an unemployed council in Chicago on the near west side. One thing it was necessary to do was to fight evictions. Between 1932 and 1935, over 20,000 families in Chicago were put out on the streets with no place to go, and uh, there was an eviction on 13th Street. And uh, the people had called the South Side headquarters of the unemployed council. The police had arrested hundreds of people, truckload after truckload, trying to put this one family back in. By the time we got to the house where the evicted family was, the police came out from everywhere, you know? And um, one of them with a a, a detective with a sawed-off shotgun got up on the top of the steps. And he was so big and so mean, and he said, the first son of a bitch that put the foot on the steps, he said, is going to have their head shot right off. So I said, well, now, Katie, is your is or is your ain't, you know? <laughs> so I start marching up the steps. And as I started up the steps, the young white fella goes along with me. And then suddenly I see a young Negro man and his wife on each side of it. So there were four of us going up the steps. And we walked right up to this detective with his sawed off shotgun, went past him, and came to the house and put our backs up against the door and then kick the door with our, with our heels. And then the whole number of police cars came. All the people came out of their houses. And uh, I guess the, the man must have been the lieutenant of police or something in the area. And he, he said, damn it. He says, I'm tired of this. Let's call it quits the hell with it. He said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. He says, I'm going to pass my hat. And the landlord was there. He says, I'm going to pass my hat for a collection. And every policeman here has to put some money in this hat. And then he passed the hat around. And he called the landlord over. And he says, here's your damn rent. And I don't want to hear another word. Now go ahead, open that door. Of course, the police weren't usually generous. Usually they were vicious, really vicious. Believe me, they fought us. With police clubs, with black jacks, with brass knuckles. They used dried banana stalks because they showed less bruises. They used everything, but nothing daunted us. We fought back every inch of the way, and we were proud. We were fighting for justice. And we gave our lives to it, and gladly. So on the south side, they killed three men. These were, these were black men? Yes, three Negroes were. The police killed three Negroes? Yes, yes. They shot them in the back as they were carrying in the furniture. And in those days, it wasn't like it is now when they, you know, when they killed the Black Panthers or anybody, you asked for an investigation. To us, it was class warfare. It was, you know, you fought them and they fought you and uh, that's it. So uh, there was a funeral. Now we started from 31st and State and the nearest station is the Englewood station at 63rd Street. State Street was crowded with thousands of people from wall to wall, from one end of State Street to the other. It was just a mass of people. Young people with a sheet went along the sidewalk and then they would throw money into the sheet. 
the streetcars would just barely crawl along through the crowd. And that was the first time in my life that I have seen white people sobbing, really sobbing. There was such a, a strong feeling. There can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? But the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. place of power greater than their hoarded gold, greater than the might of atoms magnified a thousandfold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old, for the union makes us strong. large industrial unions today? Well, I think that they're quite a bit like the Eva Bell was at that time. I think that I think that they have not organized the unorganized. I think they've become conservative, very conservative. I think there's a tremendous amount of white collar workers that should be organized, and this is not their major concern. I think the unions should more also become involved in things outside of unions, the nadir type things, you know, consumer, ecology, et cetera, to a greater degree, mm -hmm. in a nutshell. At what point do you think uh, some of the industrial unions began to become a little bit less responsive to the needs of the workers? One of the radical unions you were kicked out by the CIO, uh -huh. by Murray and that group. I think that's really when the... Or, you know, mass organization of the unorganized went on a downhill and downgrade and the unions became more conservative. And during the period of McCarthy, it had its tremendous repercussions. You know, there was an atrophy of creativity then. Kate, I wonder if you've ever regretted becoming a radical and having the life you did. No. Uh, and there have been times when some members of my family, especially in the recent years in my old age when I'm not in good health anymore, who said, hmm, you had to open your big mouth. <laughs> now, with your intelligence, you could have been something. But what are you now? You're nothing. That's what you are. You're just nothing. And uh, I said, well, that's your way of looking at it, but it isn't my way. I have no regrets. I have no regrets whatsoever. I feel that there was purpose in my life, and there were very difficult times, but I'm proud to say that I survived them. When are you as an organizer back then, when you assess the impact of unions in your own work, do you think that you did, do you feel good now about what you did, and what do you see that, that mm -hmm. happened? 
I feel really very is. good. I feel very good. I know we made a lot of changes. I know that we trained a lot of people, you know, that, um, and some of that, that thinking is around, you know, and even though we have, uh, you know, the George Beanies and, and, and the solid artists and the guys ripping and running up and down in the White House, uh, who have forgotten from whence they came that, uh, that there is a movement, uh, you know, below. When the women's movement first came along, what did you think about it? Fabulous, great, you know. I said, uh, I became part of it. Uh, formed, became part of a group through some young women who invited me and, and another friend of mine who were the oldsters in this group. Uh, long time overdue. Uh, and uh, I participated to whatever degree I could. And I thought it was just great. In your work with the women's movement, did you find any uh, difficulties personally? Yes, I did. I have a certain impatience with some young women who I feel can't relate to uh, working women. When you come from an area or an economic uh, base, when you have choices, you know, that you can't relate to people then who don't have, you know. And women who, who have to work uh, for a living uh, in the factories or in homes or in offices have a whole different concept of life and, you know, what is needed and required. Mm -hmm. And you felt, it sounds like you felt to some degree that women in the women's movement who you knew didn't really understand that very well. I, uh, well, I, how could they? Maybe they hadn't lived long enough or had the same problems. They didn't have the same experiences, you know. On the other hand, I think that many of these women have done tremendous amounts of, of uh, revolutionary work. Opened up all sorts of ideas and concepts I had, didn't have. I still believe in socialism, but I'll tell you something. I don't know if there is one single European country that has the kind of socialism that I would want. To me, socialism would mean that the greatest amount of say-so should be the people themselves. Let the people decide. There's some tremendous potential in people, and labor people, and working people, and, and union people. And, uh, and I think that uh, they're very democratic, you know, and I think that there's a tremendous militancy that's sometimes below the surface and it'll rise and come up. I don't think the American working people are going to let down this country. And I don't think any fascist bastards are going to take over either. Carry it on, carry it on, carry it on, oh, carry it on. There's a task that lies before us. We are strong when we're together. There's a word that's need and saying. Carry it on, carry it on. Look with pride in where we've come from and with hope. Come on, stay. 